So I had a really difficult time. I was very germ conscious. So some of the stuff uh, wasn't related to germs. Like I would only do things in in a multiple of four or I wouldn't step on cracks, but most of it was germ related. So I didn't touch other people or my food or doorknobs or there were so many things that I, I wasn't allowed to do. Hi, this is Shlomo Sosin, the host of the Teenage Impact Podcast, where I share stories, tips, specific strategies on how you as a teenage kid can overcome any struggle in your life. I've interviewed nearly 70 people from around the world on their story, how they were able to overcome their struggles in their life, and how you can too. I have phenomenal news. Yes, I did over almost 70 interviews, but I'm releasing my brand new book called Never Fight Alone. It's going to be releasing in hardcover and ebook September 15th. And this book is a compilation of 51 of those inspiring interviews on their story, how they're able to overcome the struggles in life, how you can as well, and how you can improve your mental health. I truly do believe this is a life-changing book. It's like a Chicken Soup of the Soul by Jack Canfield or A Tribe of Mentors by Tim Ferriss, except it's a book that is geared towards teens to improve your mental health. I interviewed well-known people and non-well-known people from around the world, and they have two things in common. They have inspiring stories, and they are resilient enough to beat the struggle of whatever they were going through. If you want to learn more about the book, click the link in the description. It's going to tell you a little bit more about the book. You can receive update on where you can purchase the book if you put your name and your email in. And then from there on, I will send you updates on when and where the book is available. Today's podcast guest is Johnny Crowder. Johnny is the CEO and founder for Cope Notes, which is a phenomenal mental health resource that disrupts your negative thinking patterns throughout the day. He's also the brand ambassador for NAMI, which stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness. He studies psychology at the University of Central Florida, and he also gave a well-known TED Talk. It wasn't always easy for him. What led Johnny down this successful path, it was his past. He struggled for many years in elementary school, middle school, and high school. He went through schoolyard bullying, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, eating disorders, hallucinations, suicide attempts, bipolar disorder, OCD, schizophrenia, and ADHD. Now, we're not going to talk about every single one of these struggles. We are just going to touch base on just a few. What we are going to focus on is how you can disrupt your negative thinking patterns. So give it up for Johnny Crowder. Johnny, my man from Tampa, Florida. How's it going, man? Thank you for having me. I am feeling better for sure. It is storming like crazy right now, and there's someone outside with a leaf blower. In a oh, storm. Gosh, I, yeah, I heard uh, in Tampa it's <laughs> um, pretty bad right now. Uh, storming, um, a lot of bad storms. But you just you getting over the coronavirus, right? Yeah, I I was exposed like three and a half weeks ago, and then I was symptomatic for like a week or two. So now I'm at the tail end. I've had no symptoms for a couple of days, so I am excited to get back out there into the world again. <laughs> get back out on the streets i you know watch your ted talk i listen to i you know research your story and pretty inspirational what you're doing with cope notes when did some of your life struggles be begin and what were they well i grew up in an abusive household so um, probably not the greatest environment for a developing mind and er early on when i was younger I was exhibiting symptoms of mental illness and self-harm, which is interesting because a lot of people don't really see that kind of stuff until middle school. But for myself, at a really young age, my parents actually had to watch me to make sure that I wouldn't hurt myself. As a kid, I would, and I mean a toddler, um, very, very young age, I would like hit my head against walls and try wow. to um, like hurt myself with toys and stuff. And it was 
uh, obviously I don't remember any of this, but it was at a very, very young age that I think um, my parents were probably like, oh, this kid's going to be a handful. From there until about middle school is where things really started ramping up. And then I think it was probably at its peak in high school and college. So it was a very long drawn out series of like you would peel back a layer and find another symptom, peel back another layer and find another symptom. So it was a pretty difficult run ever since I can remember, really. Mm -hmm. And what would you say your top three struggles were in middle school and high school? Uh, One of them is OCD, for sure. So I had a really difficult time. I was very germ conscious. So some of the stuff uh, wasn't related to germs. Like I would only do things in in a multiple of four, or I wouldn't step on cracks, but most of it was germ related. So I didn't touch other people or my food or doorknobs, or there were so many things that I I wasn't allowed to do. Um, So that that made living very difficult, which led to um, a lot of suicidal ideation and self-harm. So that was another area that I really struggled. And then probably if I had to pick three, the third that was most disruptive was probably I I was struggling with an eating disorder mm-hmm. and it was really like the the perfect storm of like the worst of all worlds so I had a very unhealthy relationship with food during that time for sure mm-hmm. and can you clarify what OCD is just in case you know people are listening you know a lot of people just throw in the word OCD like it very loosely oh, they're very conscious about certain things, oh, you're so OCD, but can you actually clarify the exact definition of what it is? You're right. I think a lot of people say OCD when they mean particular. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this person really likes their soup this particular way, so they're really OCD about their soup. And I'm not a clinician, so I I might not give you the clinical definition, but the way I see it is OCD, there's three components. There's obsessive compulsive disorder. So if we focus... On the first word, obsessive means that it is they are unending intrusive thoughts. So these thoughts are barraging you. It's not like, oh, I wish that painting was straight. That's not OCD. OCD is thought after thought after thought. I can't stop thinking about the painting. I know I'm supposed to be com- focusing on the conversation, but an hour or three hours later or seven days later, you're still thinking about how the painting was crooked. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the obsessive part. And then the compulsive part is you're at least for myself, keep in mind, not a clinician, but, um, for myself, it was behaviors. I would engage in these really compulsive behaviors, ones that I didn't agree with. Like, you know, the classic one is like turning light switches on and off, but I think a more, a more, uh, personal example was not stepping on cracks. I would have to look at the ground all the time and I couldn't step on cracks and I couldn't sit near windows was another thing. The first part, the O in OCD, for, for me had a lot more to do with my thoughts, these intrusive thoughts, thoughts that I didn't want that I couldn't prevent. And then the C, compulsive, was more related to my actions and how I was doing things that I didn't really want to do. And then the disorder, the D in OCD, um, really is just indicative of those things being so disruptive in your life that they are debilitating. So for me, most of my day was spent either thinking thoughts that I didn't want to think or doing things that I didn't want to do. And that created disorder in my life. Mm -hmm. And how did being OCD lead to your suicidal ideation? Well, it made being awake and alive excruciating. Mm -hmm. Like it was... (laughs) You know, if I wanted to make a sandwich, it would take like 50 minutes. It would take so much time because I had to lay the the first piece of bread just right and I couldn't touch anything. Mm -hmm. And then I had to, if I laid this one piece of cheese wrong, I'd have to start over and put everything back in the container, put everything back in the fridge and then leave the kitchen and then come back and try it again. And it made very simple tasks like taking a shower or brushing your teeth so emotionally taxing and frustrating that I I genuinely didn't want to be alive anymore because of how difficult everything was. I just figured if stuff is always going to be this hard and this, this complicated, then I don't want to keep living. I didn't know that things could eventually get better. I just figured this is kind of my lot in life. And what did you do to make things better? 
or try to do? Well, for a long time, I just tried to get as good as possible at OCD. <laughs> I tried to be like, okay, well, if I'm not allowed to step on cracks, then I'm going to get really good at avoiding cracks uh-huh. or I'm going to only, I'm going to learn where I can walk and where I can't walk and avoid certain things. So I, or I thought, well, with food, I'll only eat things with utensils and then that will make it a lot easier to not touch my food. So I think at the time I thought I was coping healthily, but really I was just limiting myself based on what my OCD said I could and couldn't do. Mm -hmm. I know in your TED talk, you said there was no exact turning point, like how you see in movies or inspirational videos. When did things start to get better and how? Yeah, the yeah, my TED talk is about how there wasn't really a moment like that. So I don't know how to answer that. I think yeah. it was just this long, gradual, frustrating experience where every once in a while I would catch myself doing something that didn't line up with what I thought my OCD could and couldn't allow mm-hmm. me to do. I think part of it, one thing that really helped me was therapy because my therapist helped me understand which behaviors I wanted to do and which behaviors I did not want to do. I think the more aware you are of the nature of your behavior, the more, I don't even want to say control because control is a very OCD kind of thing, but the, the more conscious you are of the way you're behaving and where those behaviors are coming from, the more leverage you have to determine how you will behave in the future. So I think sitting down with a therapist really helped educate me on basically identifying my behaviors. And I also would say uh, I did go to school for psychology and that helped a lot. So like learning about it personally in therapy, but then objectively like in a textbook or something that really created a healthy balance. Uh If you can go back in, in high school and middle school, what would be the things that you would do differently to cope with it better? I would have started going to therapy way earlier. I only had to start going to therapy because it was like uh, mandatory counseling and Uh, I fought it for years before that. And uh, I would definitely start going to therapy earlier. If I knew what I know now, I would stop allowing stigma to get in the way of me um, talking about Mm -hmm. it or understanding it. Like I would lie to myself about how I felt because I would stigmatize what I was feeling. So I, I was judging myself for how I felt. So I would just lie and say that I didn't feel that way. So I wouldn't feel bad about myself. So I think I would, I would engage in treatment earlier and I would work on reducing my self stigma for sure. Mm-hmm. Why do you think opening up at a young age is hard? Well, you, as a toddler, you think that you're the only person in the world. And then you, when you become aware of other people, you almost get more selfish. You're like, well, I know that there are other people, but what I really care about is what they think of me and what they can do for me and my relationship with them. So it takes a while to get to a point where you're like, wow, some people just aren't going to like me and that's okay. And I think especially in middle school was where I started thinking like, oh no, I have pimples. And like, people are going to think I'm ugly because I have pimples or, you know, whatever, whatever I was judging myself for, it was around what other people would think of me with mental health. It was the same thing. It's like, I don't want to tell anybody I'm dealing with this because they'll think I'm crazy or they won't trust me or they won't like me or whatever. So a lot of it had to do with just the way other people would perceive me. Mm -hmm. Many times in life we get stuck. You know, we feel stuck, whether it is a certain mental health struggle, whether we're trying to get, Uh, a career off the ground, whether we are trying to get better grades, whether we are constantly getting bullied and we don't know how to get people to stop. They just feel stuck. What is one actionable step someone could do right now or today to get unstuck? Well, I've been reading a lot about exercise and diet like my whole life. I've been fascinated with like how your body responds to the fuel you put into it and then the energy that you spend with that fuel. And one thing that I've, I've noticed as a common thread is just 
um, surprising your body is really healthy. So if you always eat this thing every day, try switching it up and having something else and your body will adapt. And if you're so used to doing the same type of exercise every day, switch it up. And that surprise is kind of what jump starts your system and your body goes, oh, we were kind of being lazy before, but now we really have to apply ourselves. I would say a great way to feel unstuck is to purposely do something different. So um, for me during quarantine, I, so before quarantine, I never watched movies like ever. (laughs) I've seen maybe like 10 or 20 movies my whole life. Why? 28 years old. I, I just always am... I'll either play music or I'll go outside or I'm, I'm not really like a movie type of person during quarantine. When this started, I'm like, I have to do something different. So I started watching movies like movies that I've heard of that are serious. And if I ever did watch a movie, it would be like a funny movie or something. So I started watching like serious movies, just a couple, like maybe once one every week or two or something And it really woke up something else in me where I started focusing on like set design and wardrobe and um, commitment to character. And I was like, whoa, I didn't even know I liked this. I think you can do the same thing with anything. Just inject something into your life that you don't normally do, like take a Taekwondo class or try to do yoga or try to cook a dish you've never cooked before, listen to an artist you've never listened to. And really the, that, change serves as evidence to your brain that you don't know everything Mm -hmm. so it reminds your it's a good way to remind yourself that the world is bigger than you think and most of the time we only feel stuck because we feel like the world is very small and constrictive Mm -hmm. you know tony robbins not sure if you know who he is but Tony, big self-help guru he's been transforming lives for 40 plus years celebrities worldwide figures big name people presidents and he always uses this analogy with the golf swing. You know, he's, he's off, totally off with the ball, but all it takes is a, a tiny shift in the body or a tiny shift with your swing to actually get the ball in the hole or close to the hole. And sometimes all it takes for us is to make that tiny, tiny shift that we do, like 1% shift in your day, to make things right and get unstuck. So I love to I love to tell people that when uh, when people always tell me, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm not making enough money, or my business not taking off, or I'm not getting good grades, or these things are happening to me. Dude, I I mean, even in the the yeah. TED talk, I say something like, if you change your direction right now by just a degree, mm-hmm. you won't really feel like you made a difference at all, but down the line, you'll see how big of a difference it made. So I'm a big fan of small steps and small changes. Of course, we all wish we could wake up tomorrow and just be like, okay, today is the day I revolutionized my life. But in all likelihood, it's going to be a long, slow process. And those little changes do make a big difference over time. Not just little changes, but also consistent action. Mm -hmm. Same things over and over and over again. A little bit every day. Like you said, very small right now, but the huge chain roll, you won't notice it till years down the road. Oh, yeah. But you always talk about, I've, I've heard you say, if someone thinks negatively all the time, how to stop that negative voice in your head and replace it to something a little bit more positive. Can you get a little bit more deeper into that? And how someone can do that? Well, obviously, that's what Cope Notes is designed to do. But I don't want to spend the whole time talking about uh, what I do. If you're curious about it, you can go to copenotes.com and read about it. Mm -hmm. But I think a more um, practical piece of advice is make sure you are taking in some sort of stimulus that conflicts with your negative worldview. So, you know, you know how when you're really sad, you want to go listen to a sad song? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm saying do not that. I know that it feels like good in a really morbid way to just soak and wallow in your sadness. And sometimes I think that it's, yeah, I, I actually think it's really important to feel your feelings. Like if you're sad, be sad. But when it comes to negativity, where you doubt yourself and you, you think that there's no hope for the future and you're um, very critical 
I think that what you can do to interrupt that is make sure that you have something on hand, like something on deck to catch yourself. Like step one is recognizing you're stuck in a negative thought pattern, but step two is interrupting it on purpose. Put something in there. If you have a go-to song, like I have a, I have a playlist, you can do whatever you want. But for me, uh, music is kind of my language. So I have a playlist that I made of, it's called calm down. And it's a bunch of songs that really chill me out. And when I find myself being getting really anxious or really doubtful about my future, or I get really angry about something, I put on my calm down playlist. And that's my way of interrupting that negative thought pattern. But for you, it could be, you know, if you have a breathing exercise you like to do, if a certain stretch or you go on a walk or you pet your dog, like just actively get in front of that negative thought train and be like, I'm going to put a rock on the train tracks so that we can derail this thing. Mm -hmm. How many times does someone have to do that until they no longer have those negative thoughts or will they even interrupt in the long term? I don't mean for this to sound Mm -hmm. negative, but it is okay if you never get to a point where you don't think negative thoughts anymore. We know, we know that we think tens of thousands of negative thoughts on a daily basis automatically. We have automatic negative thought. That's something that happens in the brain. Um, when you imagine yourself failing a test, you didn't mean to imagine that. Your brain did it. I don't, I don't mean to speak out of pocket. Like Maybe a clinician can be like, no, there is a way to only think positive thoughts. But in my experience, it hasn't been about stopping, like getting to a point where all of my thoughts are positive. It's been more about being able to better identify if a thought is positive or negative. And then if the thought is negative, actively employing something that can combat it. And it's, it's about shortening that gap. So the gap between you having the thought and identifying it, and then identifying it and doing something about it. I'm trying to make all those windows shorter so that I'm, I, I respond more quickly. Mm-hmm. My brother-in-law, he he told me, you know, back when he was in his early 30s, what he used to do is when he used to get anxiety or thought negatively, he used to just block it out by just going la 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 la, la. <laughs> like kind of like a little bit out loud until it goes away, and then he continues with the day, talks Something. to himself. And give himself like a pet talk until it kind of goes away. And then he, he would automatically like recognize when you're having those thoughts like, oh, I'm not worthy enough or I'm not going to get into this college or I'm going to fail this exam or my parents or my friends told this about me. So it must be true. We always get these outside factors. And I think sometimes the best thing to do is quickly recognize you're having those thoughts and give yourself a quick pep talk. Or like you said, put some calm music. Or whatever works for you. I think everyone's different. What are some of the best mental health resources out there? And you can actually go into uh, Cope Notes a little bit if you want to. Sure. Well, yeah, one of my goals is for Cope Notes to be one of the yeah. best or the best mental health resource out there. And um, if you're listening to this or watching this and you don't know what Cope Notes is, we help you train your brain to think healthier thoughts over time. So all the stuff that we're talking about, that's what we specialize in. So once a day, we send a text at a random time and uh, all of our texts are, um, whether it's like a psychology fact or advice or encouragement or journaling prompt, it's written by peers with lived experience. So these are people who understand, who have been in your shoes, who get it. Um, it's not uh, written by, it's not a bunch of jargon and like stuffy clinical talk, but then they're reviewed by a panel of mental health professionals to make sure we're not just texting people like smile and be happy today. We actually want to te- text people helpful stuff. And then people um, can respond at any time and it's completely anonymous. So you can say, whatever you want, whenever you want. And it's, I always tell people, picture it like a journal that reaches out to you every day. A lot of people, like every single therapist I've ever been to has said, you have to journal. And I've said, no, 
I've just totally not followed that advice at all until the last couple of years when I started journaling and I realized it makes a big difference. So this is a journaling tool that on, on the days when you feel like getting better, on the days when you feel like staying in bed all day and not getting dressed, not talking to anybody, Cope Notes is there on every type of day you will ever have. We are that consistent positive interruption to your negative thought patterns. And over time, um, the goal is to equip you to handle and cope with life in healthier ways. So it's not designed to, it's not designed like for people with specific diagnoses or anything like that. It's just for, for anyone who's interested in getting mentally and emotionally healthier. Mm -hmm. And is it, it's kind of like sending affirmations to people every day? So a lot of people think that that's what we do. They think that it's affirmations like you're strong, Mm -hmm. you're powerful. Um, But that's not really a lot of what we do. I mean, we do send some affirmations, but like I said, there's psychology facts, there's exercises, there's journaling prompts, there's pieces of advice and encouragement and all sorts of different types of content around stress and loneliness and anxiety and frustration and doubt and guilt, um, all of these different things that we feel. So I think that saying that we send affirmations to people is kind of misleading people with what we do. This is, this is not a brighten your day tool. This is a long-term thought pattern and behavior change tool. So if we can make you happier today, that's great. That's an awesome byproduct of what we're doing. But what we're really doing, what we're more concerned with is who are you in nine months? If someone rear ends you or if your girlfriend breaks up with you, how do you respond? Um, how, how big of a toll does that take on you? What is your action? And that's really what we're doing is we are sewing into future you to make sure that you handle the crappy stuff healthily. And when someone responds back, you know, I receive a text message, I respond back just based off of what I'm feeling, what happens after that? Nothing. That is my favorite part of Coke Notes. <laughs> so it's just like a journal. Uh-huh. Um, it's not a crisis response resource. You're not speaking to a counselor or anything. This is a place for you to say everything you need to say and for there to be no repercussion. So mm-hmm. part of the problem with um, therapy for me, for example, was I would change what I said based on my therapist's response. So I'd kind of lie and fudge and like water down what I felt because I wanted my therapist to like me and I didn't want to get in trouble. So over time, I started lying to myself about how I felt because I was so used to lying to other people. Mm-hmm. And the journaling feature of Cope Notes, just like a physical journal, you write out the, you, you pour your heart out in a physical journal. It doesn't interrupt you. It doesn't share what you said with anybody. It doesn't offer its opinion. No, you got to say what you needed to say. Mm-hmm. And there were no repercussions. There are no consequences. And that's what we're trying to create is an anonymous confidential resource, just like a physical journal. But over time, what that does is improve your emotional IQ and your emotional independence, which means you don't need another person to sort through your feelings because you're so used to doing it on your own. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the other best mental health resources out there besides Cope Notes? I will personally vouch for, and you can Google whichever ones you want. There are plenty. What I would say is um, I will personally recommend in-person therapy. That has done wonders for me. I know during COVID, um, some people might be doing digital. Like I'm doing digital therapy right now. My, my therapist lives in Australia, actually. So I would recommend actually doing therapy. So many people have resistance to it and I get it, but I definitely encourage people to look into that. And then also NAMI is awesome for when you don't know what therapy or or what resources you're looking for. So Uh when I first connected with NAMI, I was like, I don't even know what I should be trying to do. And I think that's what made my first experience with NAMI so great. And there's, there's a NAMI chapter wherever you live or, or within a few hours of where you live, hopefully. For me, I just went there and I was like, hey, here's my situation. Who do I talk to? What do I look for? Is there like a, a class I'm supposed to take or is there a book I should read or what? Mm-hmm. Is there someone I can meet with? Like, what the heck? Where do I turn? So if you're in that camp where you just kind of don't even know where to get started, I would recommend just uh, looking, just Googling to see if there is a NAMI chapter 
near where you live. And NAMI is N-A-M-I, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. If you don't know where to start, I would recommend NAMI as a great starting place. Great. A lot of my interviews are based off of resilience, how someone can overcome their struggles in life. Um, I've interviewed people who were sexually abused. I interviewed people who went to jail, was sentenced to 14 years in prison, now spoken in hundreds and hundreds of schools around the world. And they found some way to not let those situations define them, but they define the situation. I end every single interview with this one question. What does resiliency mean to you? Mm. I think it just means remembering that when stuff happens, Mm -hmm. you are the person it's happening to or around. Like you are not the thing that's happening. So like for schizophrenia, for example, a lot of times I would think, you know, I'm crazy. I would think that thought, I'm crazy. And then I would be like, no, my schizophrenia is suggesting components of reality that aren't really there. I'm the one who's identifying those thoughts as not being true or accurate Mm -hmm. in their representation of reality. So it's, I think resilience is remembering that you're the person, you're not the thing that's happening. Um, And it's easy to think that like, oh, I'm, you know, for me, it's like, I'm a suicide and abuse survivor. That's like part of my bio. But if I wasn't, I would still be me. If my name was something different, I would still be me. If I, if I listened to a different type of music or did a different type of work, I would still be me. So it's just remembering that you're still you if you, if you shave your head or you get a tattoo or if you move across the country like you did. Yeah. It's resilience is remembering that you are the person who's doing or experiencing those things. Mm-hmm. You are not those things. Mm-hmm. That's so true. We get so lost in our identity of what happens to us. You know, I was bullied for 15 years as well for how I spoke. And a lot of times we get so caught up based off of the situations that we put ourselves in. Other people put a label on us or we put a label, label on ourselves. But we forget that what makes us is our values, what we stand for, and the good that we bring to our community. Johnny, do you have any last tips right now for anyone who's either thinking about committing suicide, who doesn't really think highly of themselves, are in a rut, or constantly thinking negatively? I would say don't beat yourself up. So I I said this at a show in, uh, I think, Kentucky or something. I said, don't hurt yourself because the world around you is, is going to do enough damage to you anyway. You, you yeah. fall down a, a flight of stairs or you bump your, your funny bone when you're doing dishes or whatever. You're going to get hurt in some way a lot in this life. Almost every day you, you will get hurt somehow. Mm-hmm. And the idea that you are hurting yourself on top of that by shaming yourself or guilting yourself or, or beating up on yourself about how you should be this and you're not – Uh, I always just say the world is going to do enough damage. Don't help the world in there in that you need to help yourself. And I know it sounds um, it's a lot more complicated than what I'm making it out to be. But the point of it is the world doesn't need help with that. The Mm -hmm. world needs help getting its crap together. So I say, just try to be your own teammate, try to be in your own corner try to encourage and motivate yourself the way you would a friend or family member. And if you can be a better friend to yourself, guaranteed it's going to change the way you live your life. Wow. That is powerful. And Johnny, where can people find you? If you go to copenotes.com, you will find everything you need to know. We have a podcast, we have t-shirts. Obviously we have the services that we provide. Um, My Ted talk is on there. And then if you want to get in touch with me personally, I'm on Facebook. My name is Johnny Crowder and I'm on Instagram. My handle is at Johnny Crowder loves you because I do. Mm-hmm. Awesome, man. What a phenomenal interview. You know, going into this interview, I didn't even realize you're from Tampa, Florida, and you have such an inspirational message. There is this one quote I want to take away from your TED talk. You know, I'm, I don't have, I don't put the degrees on my wall. 
Um, I, I don't do that, but I do have the scars to prove it. I mean, something along those lines. I didn't mm -hmm. phrase it exactly, but man, keep on shining your light, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you for tuning into this podcast episode. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, click the link in the description to learn more about my book, Never Fight Alone. If you haven't done so already and you're tuning in from Apple Podcasts, Please take 30 seconds to rate and review Teenage Impact. The more people that rates and review, reviews Teenage Impact, Apple will recommend my podcast to more people, which means I can impact more lives. I'm truly grateful for all my listeners. And until next time, peace.